Hi, everyone, and welcome to the AIHM wellness webinar. We are so excited this week to, to have two extraordinary visionary leaders in the integrative medicine field, uh, Dr. Romy Mushtaq and Dr. Madia Saeed. And um, they're going to be talking with us today about holistic healthcare from an Islamic perspective. But before we get started, as everyone's starting to come into the room, I just want to introduce, for those of you who don't know, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. AIHM is a global interprofessional integrative health association working to transform healthcare, body, mind, spirit, community, and planet. And um, our collective history is over 70 years of leadership that started back in the 1970s with the formation of the American Holistic Medical Association. And um, in the early 2000s, we merged with the ABIHM, the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine, which many of you um, were certified in in the early days of integrative medicine. And then most recently last year, we, for, we merged with the Academic Collaborative for Integrative Health that represented the um, formal licensed integrative health professions in the United States. And we are just so, so excited to move forward a global agenda for all of us and really, really um, get access to integrative healthcare to everyone on this planet. So welcome to today's um, wellness webinar. For those of you who are interested in training, um, we do have a, a fellowship training, a thousand hour fellowship that's really incredible. It is interprofessional and our next cohort starts um, in October of 2022. So if you um, are here for the first time and learning about it and you mention this amazing webinar with these two extraordinary women, um, you can get a discount of uh, $2,000 off tuition if you do join the fellowship. So just remember to check that out. So I'd like to shift now to um, introduce our two presenters um, and welcome our special guests. Dr. Romy Mushtaq is an MD, she's board certified physician and award-winning wellness speaker and the founder of Brain Shift at Work. She has over 20 years of authority in neurology, integrative medicine and mindfulness. And she's on a mission to transform mental health and wellness in the workplace by working with Fortune 500 companies, professional athletes and global associations. She's the chief wellness officer for Evolution Hospitality, where she scaled a mindfulness and wellness program to over 7,000 employees. And her expertise is featured in the national media, such as NPR, NBC, TED Talks, and Forbes. So welcome, Dr. Mushtaq. And then along her side here is Dr. Mahida Saeed, who is a board certified family physician um, and holistic mom. Uh, on so social media, you can find her at Holistic Mom. Um, her best-selling uh, author books are The Holistic Remedy, Your Guide to Healing Chronic Inflammation and Disease, which is a best-selling children's book series, um, Adam's Healing Adventures. She's also written The Quranic Prescription, Unlocking the Secrets to Optimal Health, and The Holistic Remedy for Kids, Parenting he Healthy Children to Save Our Future. She's the Director of Education for Documenting Hope and for Know We Well. She's the President of Nagamiya Institute of Islamic Medicine and Sciences, a regular on the international Emmy-winning medical talk show, The Dr. Nandi Show. And her children host the Holistic Kids Show podcast, for those of you with integrative kids out there, which helps kids empower and educate other kids. So I really just want to welcome both of you um, for being here um, also at the end of such an in incredible holiday um, worldwide. And so um, welcome and thank you again for being part of the AHM community and being here to educate us today. Alhamdulillah. Oh my gosh, Dr. I, I, I call Tabby, but Dr. Tabitha Parker, such an honor to have us here. Uh, I'm Dr. Romy, everyone, or as they know me at Evolution Hospitality, Homie Romy. And if there was one other sister colleague champion in the world I was going to have here with me, it's it's my sister, Dr. Madiha. Hi, Dr. Madiha Sayed. 
Oh my gosh. Hi, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, as we'll say in, um, in Arabic. May peace be with you. I am so incredibly honored. Thank you so much for the Academy for having us here today to talk about this really important topic that influences each one of us because um, you know, especially we're in a time right now that's almost the end of Ramadan. So this has been like, this is like the cherry on top of the cake. So this has been amazing. So thank you again. Well, so it was 10 years ago that I first found my path to integrative medicine and the community as it was back then, Dr. Tabby. And um, had anybody told me a decade later, this is where Dr. Madiha and I would be, on so many levels, reading both of our bios, I don't know that we could have seen that this was a path Allah had for us. But to be honest, I think the most sacred thing is we get to share the end of Ramadan with all of our colleagues that are here live on the webinar, watching the recording or on Facebook. I wanted to open um, uh, and just introduce myself on a personal level. I am the um, daughter of immigrants. And in the United States, they say something, they call it English as a second language. My dad will always remind me, Vika, technically English is your third language, right? After Hindi or Urdu and Punjabi and Madiha the same. same. And, um, you know, uh, we do that. And yet here we are today in a great country where what I get to accomplish as a professional woman, I, I couldn't have done anywhere else in the world other than being an American and how far we've come in celebrating Ramadan. Um, my mom and dad are, uh, there are just like in other re monotheistic religions of the world in Islam, there are different sects. Uh, you often hear about Sunnis and Shias. I identify as Sufi. And um, what is Sufism? Uh, it can get a different meanings in the West. Uh, I come from the traditional, traditional point of view that Sufism is based on the teachings of Islam and uh, the teachings of one God. And we recognize all people that are of God, um, as they say, so from any religion and that prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last prophet and the teachings of the Quran. And so uh, the very famous poet Rumi, which if you've, I, I think at any academy meeting I've ever been to, most of the presenters are sharing it. A Rumi quote is a very well-known Muslim Sufi scholar and one of the most celebrated poets in the world. And I thought in honor of our holy month, I would open with a quote from him and Madiha will close our session with many beautiful quotes from the Quran about healing. Um, and this one specifically that we are fasting many people in the holy month of Ramadan. And uh, what Rumi says about fasting is when like a reed, you fill with his breath, then you'll taste the sweetness. When the brain and the belly are burning from fasting, every moment a new song rises out of the fire. So my intention is, is that this next time that we have together is a time to share these sweet songs and, and memories and that. And so with that, I, I was going to start off initially just having a general conversation for our colleagues, knowing that you might or might not have any colleagues or friends that identify as Muslim. And I thought Dr. Madiha and I back and forth would have some questions. And uh, Dr. Parker is here, Dr. T Tabby or Dr. Tabitha Parker, as we know her, um, to just interject with any questions or comments we're getting either here on the live stream or in Facebook um, and do that. What I wanted to start with was the history of Islam in the United States. I think there's a few misconceptions that we want, Madiha and I want to clear up together. Then we wanted to talk about what we, as your Muslim colleagues in medicine, want you to know. Just some Romy and Madiha real talk, two sisters, yeah. And then we were going to talk about what are some special considerations to have in your for your Muslim patients, whether you're practicing traditional medicine, chiropractic care, naturopathic care, or holistic medicine? And then Medea is going to close us off with some wisdom and healing, um, the chronic prescriptions that are universal healing um, as a part of her latest best-selling book. So I thought I would start off. If you look at the media and the way they often misrepresent the religion I identify with and that I was born with, they make you think that Islam in America came with awful terms like terrorists or those from the Middle East. And that's not honoring the diversity, equity, inclusion that we believe in at AIHM or uh, in Islam of loving all people. And that I want to honor that the very first Muslims in the United States were actually 
the enslaved people. Because of the lack of record keeping, we don't know exactly how many, but in the uh, 17th, 18th century, when the enslaved people were being forced here in the United States from Africa and the Caribbean countries, it is estimated that anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the men, women, and children were Muslim, coming from the Eastern African countries. If you go to the Smithsonian, you'll see a very old Holy Quran that belonged to Thomas Jefferson. It was actually taken from his enslaved people. That as we know, and the um, horrific history of the enslaved people around the West, especially here in the United States, that they were stripped of their languages and their religions, which included Islam. So I would not be here today if it wasn't for our Black brothers and sisters. But something else that's really important to know as Dr. Madiha and I will tell you, we both identify as Muslim and it's very obvious English is our second language. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Prior to that, immigrants of color were not really welcomed in the United States. And you look at a quick history of how Madiha and our parents ended up here in the United States, it's pretty similar. We were talking before and we both know each other as sisters and friends, obviously, is um, due to a lot of things like in the uh, move towards factories and manufacturing, as well as the Vietnam War, um, there was a shortage in the 1950s and 60s of doctors, engineers, and scientists. And so they started to do what was known as the great brain drain of Asia and Africa. And along that simultaneously time, as you know, the great uh, civil rights movement for the right of Black people was happening in the United States. And when President Kennedy passed the multiple laws around the Civil Rights Act, in several of those was allowed that immigrants of color would be welcomed into the United States. And it was at that time that my dad, along with dozens of his colleagues, were recruited from medical students in South Asia, and Madiha, you as well, right, your father. And that's how my dad came, my mom came a few years later. Later, um, as well as, you know, our family friends who identify as Muslim from Northern Africa, um, the Middle East, and we were the first generation of children welcomed here or born here in the United States as, as Muslims. So I really wanted to share that history and that in the spirit of all the conversations we have with the DEI committee and the BIPOC committee is the um, burden that our Black Muslims and brothers have carried from the inception of the United States until today so that I can be a successful Muslim woman in this country. And I want to honor that. Um, I want to invite Dr. Madiha in to introduce herself and her family and add anything else to just what we're talking about, the history of Islam in America. Absolutely. That was beautiful. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for that. And absolutely right. The you know, the brain drain brought my dad. He was an engineer at that time. So uh, he came to Pakistan, he came to, from Pakistan to America. He didn't know anybody here in the area. So he's really had to start off, you know, completely on his own. I know he worked three, four jobs just to put some food on the table as he was um, raising us and trying to get a, you know, get his, you know, he started the engineering plus on top of that, you know, wanted to also do CPA. So he also worked just like, you know, everybody uh, really, really hard for all of us to have a better life than he did. I mean, if I, if I hear his stories, uh, you know, they, they didn't have lights when they were growing up. So like, believe me, we live a such a better life than they do. And um, and to what I've accomplished today, uh, I could never even thought about it if it wasn't for all the sacrifices that everybody had done. So I am so incredibly thankful. Yeah, I'm the, I mean, I give that. It's, you know, my mom, my dad, Madiha, when he was recruited here to come with his medical colleagues, he initially thought it was for higher education. And so my dad had already finished his internal medicine training in medical school there in Pakistan, and then came here and went through internship and residency and then cardiology fellowship. And then he was offered a job and stayed here. And then I was born and my mom and dad initially said, and then I have two brothers after that, that they were going to, you know, go back to India or Pakistan or even England where a lot of my um, father's family is. And they decided to stay here. And one of the things they realized was 
their eldest child as a daughter and the opportunities I had compared to my mother and my maternal grandmother and my paternal grandmother who died when my dad was a child. And I, I just so honor all of that. It's who I am. I couldn't have been this woman as a successful entrepreneur um, and leader, I think anywhere else in the United States. So I honor our immigrant parents and all of that history and legacy that is rich. And, you know, when I talk to um, men and women of our parents' generation, they honor, you know, the civil rights movement of the uh, Black brothers and sisters who are still the majority of the Muslims in the United States. And yet, I think when the media paints a Muslim in America, they have one image, don't they, Dr. Media? It's it's um, what they paint as a either a Middle Eastern man or a woman wearing a headscarf that they assume is oppressed. I hear that okay. often. And I think right out of the bat, you and I wanted to conquer that because nope. <laughs> I, I consider you one of my closest friends. And if people are just looking at both of us on camera, they're like, you both are Muslim. You look so different. I mean, I have a furry dog who's not feeling so well sitting at my lap on my feet. And he was on my lap right as we started. And I choose not to wear a headscarf and you do. And I thought right out of the gate, could we address that? Because there are so many misconceptions. And I'll say this is I honor every one of the women in my circles here in the United States and around the world who wear a headscarf like you do, Medea, and every single woman in my life, it is an empowered choice empowered. that you choose not to wear a headscarf or that I choose to do or not to wear a headscarf. And I thought we would just answer that question right out of the gate. What do you the think? elephant out of the room, right? Let's address yes. the elephant. Let's just go right there. <laughs> Let's just yes. go right there. <laughs> Elephant. Absolutely. So just as, you know, our, you know, women in the past, like even, you know, Mary, um, all wore like headscarves. It's all very similar. It is empowering. It is to view us more than we are as our physical characteristics, but as how we are for our heart. And there's lot, multiple different levels of modesty. And that's where um, the headscarf is just one piece of that puzzle. And while some women choose to wear it and some others, every and it does not have to dictate their religious, it doesn't equate to how religious they are at all. It really is their connection with God. And each one of them has an under, like everybody has their own individual connection. And, um, and what they believe, what they would prefer to do. But it is empowering in the fact that for specifically me as a Muslim woman, that, um, that the only person that gets to sort of, when I wear this, it's like, nobody wants to enjoy my areas besides for the person that gets, <laughs> you know, my husband or, you know, so, but otherwise it's really modesty is at multiple different levels wow. and uh, how somebody chooses to do that is their yeah. own. Uh, journey and connection to God. So there's so many different yeah. ways that you'll see toast, so many different Muslims. You'll mm -hmm. see that very similar, you know, uh, variety in the way the men dress also. So same, so very similar, the same way that women dress too. It is. And Madhya, what I want to say now we're in 2022 and we're recording this <laughs> webinar because this will live in infamy, but there are now 1.8 billion Muslims around the world. Yeah. Let's say an estimated 50% identify as women. Um, and from every different country. So countries have different style of dress that we wear. Absolutely. And, and so I think that will dictate it, but here's the one thing that people have also this misconception that you eloquently said that Muslim women are not empowered. When you look at the data of those that identify as female and Muslim in America, we're actually one of the most educated group of women in the United States tend to like three to one more likely to have a graduate degree um, as an example. So we're not disempowered at all. But here's another fun fact. My cousins live in Dubai and we have a lot of friends in those circles that choose to wear headscarf or the abaya, the black covering. But girl, can I tell you, they are some of the most fashionable women I know, because when they're only in the company of women or men that are related to them, 
the couture clothing that they are wearing underneath, <laughs> like stunning. And they take beauty as a blood sport. So please don't think we're not fashionable. And oh, like, we both got our heels. We both yeah. got our heels. Yeah. If, if you meet us at AIHM this year, we will be just killing it in our stilettos. <laughs> in our so stilettos. Like, hey, <laughs> <great>. yes. <laughs> Dr. Parker agrees. But uh, you know what? I'll be honest. I think Dr. Midi, I look to you a little bit more for fashion. I like the shoe game, but I'm a woman of STEM and fashion is not my passion. But I just really wanted to say that just like any other person, you know, that identifies women, we can all be different in our styles, same within Islam and, and my Muslim sisters, but this universally, I will say, but at the same time, I want to recognize that since 9-11 and in the last six years, I, when I prayed this Ramadan and I think of the collective sisterhood as a, as a feminist and feminist, I especially pray for my sisters like you who choose to wear a headscarf because the truth of the matter is, is that crimes and hate crimes against um, women wearing headscarves is up by, you know, 15 to 25%, depending on what region of the United States you live in. And, and that's a shame. And yeah. so like, I, I, you know, absolutely. You can go into the you know, you're just going shopping like everybody else. And they'll be like, go back to your country, how you're a terrorist. I mean, it's really, and this is why things like this is so important to really get this message out there that, you know, we can't just paint everybody with just one brush yeah. um, that we are dealing with, you know, the hatred from that, but um, it is getting better. But the thing is, it does uh, yeah. occur. So what I wanted to transition into can this, I just, can I um, make one comment? Because yes. I think this is so important because, you know, that courage to really choose knowing that you're putting yourself at risk because of that increase. I mean, there's just such courage and ad advocacy and activism in the, that act. And I just really, um, I really want to thank you for all of the Muslim women who are making that decision for their own empowerment in light of that increased risk. I think it's just so important. And I just thank you both for reframing that issue. That one issue alone is just, so, you know, it's, it's amazing how um, today in 2022, we are still just so influenced by such a small view of so many people. So I so appreciate both of you really calling that out. Thank you, Dr. Tabitha. Thank you so much. You know, one thing I wanted to transition to was um, if you have a Muslim a, a colleague that identifies as female and who is Muslim or a patient, how that may be different mm -hmm. and that we're not really maybe quiet or stupid, or we may be a little uncomfortable in the office um, and we may have different choices and that. And I thought that was really important for Dr. Madiha and I to address. So I thought I would say a few things from a point of view as a colleague and Dr. Madiha will address what happens if you're taking care of a Muslim female patient. So as a female colleague, what I do now for a living being in the public eye and speaking, people naturally want to hug me. You know, there's a vulnerable moment and even at Evolution Hospitality. And, you know, as a female Muslim, I am a little conservative with my body, even if I if I, I may not appear with my lack of headscarf or in my outfit as that. And if a uh, someone identifying as a male or that they are a male are coming towards me, you'll, you'll often see me protecting my chest or body that I, I don't feel comfortable hugging a man that's not related to me. Um, or I end up doing a side hug or that, even though someone is just really emotionally there that, you know, be careful. And some Muslims are very conservative, especially when it's a different gender, they may not even want to shake your hand. And it's not that they don't respect you or they're not friendly. It's just, depending on our comfort level and how conservative we may or may not be, we don't necessarily touch. It's, you know, and, and that is again, a personal choice, just like a headscarf. So, um, you know, I know in most US workplaces where we're talking about sexual harassment and DEI, these conversations come up, but, you know, you're gonna see Madiha and I at the conference, hopefully in October at AIHM. And just, you know, I may not be as comfortable hugging you females. Yes, someone it is because that's okay in our culture, right? So I, I'm still a little conservative and that is. So I just wanted to talk about that as, as a colleague also, um, you know, gosh, I mean, let's, can we have some Romy real talk? I entered neurology at a time where less than 5% of the brain doctors in the United States 
were women. And I had to endure a lot of that boy talk. And I didn't really want to talk and talk about sexual escapades or body parts back. And it, again, you know, some people could have mislabeled me as a prude or something like that. And I'm telling you in my private life with my, you know, romantic relationships, no, I'm not a prude, but I'm not going to talk publicly um, like a great episode of Sex in the City as much as I enjoyed watching Samantha on Sex in the City. That may not be my style, right? So I, I just kind of wanted to share that, that just because we're a little conservative or don't want to touch or hug doesn't mean we're prude or we don't have sexual feelings or enjoy sex. We just may have a different approach to it. So I think those are a few things I wanted to talk about just as your Muslim female friend or a colleague at work. Um, Dr. Media, I think it would be great if you could address if you have a Muslim female patient in your practice. Absolutely. And remember, everybody is a little different. So always ask and, and you know, asking, there's no harm in asking. None of us will ever feel offended for, is it okay if I shake your hand or is it okay, not okay? And then, because remember, just like, you know, somebody who chooses to wear a headscarf, someone who doesn't, someone who chooses to wear an abaya who doesn't, you know, so there's, everybody's a little bit different, but um, there is that modesty aspect, you know, that we do all have and everybody's modesty is in a little bit different, you know, realm. So therefore always ask, your patient as you walk into that door and they'll, they'll let you know. Um, and if, if they don't, you know, if you reach out and they don't hand, walk, you know, shake your hand, just sometimes some of they'll just go like this, um, you know, take it to your heart. Um, and, it, and it's beautiful because of the fact that they'll just know that this is just coming from what they feel comfortable with, um, you know, uh, because they each one has an, their ideas and modesty are a little bit different and how what they or feel comfortable with is a little bit different. Their uh, privacy is also a little, um, you know, in, in our religion, we are, um, you know, phys phys physically like physical touch. And then, you know, sexuality is a very private thing, intimate thing. So um, that we just restrict to the husband or just like the spouse. And so therefore, if we do have to get like paps or things like that, to know that this is not something that we are naturally doing, we don't, so um, to just to be gentle and patient with us, um, and uh, because there are different touch restrictions that everybody does have, um, and then let's go to like the alcohol and the diet, like the diet oh, piece of it. Yes, <laughs> like I remember, my Dr. Media, you know how hard it was, both my mom and dad have been patients, and this is modern day America in the last couple of years, and we'll be like, you, you can't even say kosher, no pork. They were like, it was weird in the hospitals. We would order them vegetarian trays. And then they assumed my parents were Hindu and there was still sausage, pork sausage showing up on the hospital trays. And then I think my poor dad got so paranoid and he was in the hospital for like that. He just stopped eating. You know, because like, you know, you didn't know. So gosh, I would love for you to address if you're in hospital or with a colleague, even you've invited like us to a party. Like, yeah, could, could we talk about food? Yeah. What do you think, Dr. Medea? How do we even tackle that one? Yes, because um, I get this question a lot. Like my happiness and excitement is not from alcohol. It's I'm like, alcohol. <laughs> they're like, are you sure you're not? I'm like, I swear I'm like alcohol free here. This, this I'm sober yeah. because as a Muslim, um, there's two main restrictions and that is the pork or any type of like product from a pig and then, um, and then alcohol. Those are the biggest no-nos in our religion. So yes, yeah, so if we don't share a cocktail with you, please don't take it <laughs> to heart. But, you know, our Islamic faith does like influence our decision making, the family dynamics and the health practices. So our um, specifically in Islam, Islam is a way of life. So you're going to encounter every aspect of our lives will be influenced by our religion. And um, and that's no, you know, and that also accounts to when we see patients in the office, if your doctor is also a uh, Muslim or, you know, out and about in the regular world. Yeah, it is. And, you know, there's this idea of alcohol, like some, you know, if something is cooked with alcohol, even though they say it evaporates out, we don't want to eat it. I'll give an example, Dr. Mithi, I had to travel for Evolution Hospitality where I'm chief wellness officer. And, you know, they know I don't drink and it was like a big party and I had to be there for the opening as a leader and someone spilled alcohol on my outfit and I was fasting. 
Mm-hmm. And it just felt awful. And they couldn't understand that. Like now I didn't even feel halal and I'm fasting. And now there's like the smell of some cocktail on my outfit and I had to go up and change. Right. So, so just be mindful sometimes of that and definitely pork, but that also, you know, goes along to both traditional medicine and our integrative medicine. We may not want products that are either not only halal or kosher, but, you know, so many products out there are, are derived from, uh, pork and, and pork products. So we're really mindful of that as well, you know, so Mm -hmm. Those are some important things to think about. So I I think in caring for Muslim patients, you know, just the modesty and, but please don't, if, if you are identify as a male and a female patient comes and they're a little hesitant for a breast exam or pap smear or somebody saying, I'd rather prefer a female practitioner, or you may have medical students or residents in the room and they just ask for maybe one female, um, you know, person that is there as a, as a, you know, what a witness or whatever you call it in the office, just, you know, um, be respectful of that in today's world. I know you may only have six minutes in your office visit, but um, it can do great things to create a world of trust. And remember, Muslim men are modest as well. So I find my, when I was taking care of patients one-to-one, my Muslim male patients had a sense of modesty in front of me as a female identifying doctor as well. So, you know, it's the same thing that can happen as well. So um, we wanted to address that. So I I think anything else about um, having a colleague that's a Muslim, Dr. Madiha, or a patient that you can think of that we would want to tell our colleagues or please any questions? Yeah, please let us know. I think now I think Ramadan, right? Yes. Uh, Let's dive into that. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, because let me just quickly, just to recap what we, what Dr. Romy talked about and what Islam actually is of people, you know, just, I just wanted to do a quick, quick recap. You know, Islam actually is, comes from a root word called peace. And as Muslims, we believe that God is the the creator of the universe. We believe in in the angels, all the, all the prophets that even, you know, Christ is our prophet you know, um, all the scriptures that God sent to the prophets before, we believe in the afterlife and believe in God's divine decree and their will. And we follow the Quran, which is one of the book, and then the Sunnah, which is actually the prophetic teachings. And then, so through the faith and what what we've been taught through the Quran, we believe that we can find peace through submitting to God's, God's commands. And one of those commands specifically, you know, there's different pillars of Islam. And Shahada is declaring um, one's faith in God and belief in Muhammad. Then we have Salat, where a, where a Muslim uh, will pray five times a day. We'll, um, and then Zakat is to give to those that are in need. And then Psalm is fasting, which we're in within now. And then Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca. So I thought we would talk about you know, this Ramadan, because currently our, Dr. Romi and I are fasting in this month or blessed month of Ramadan. Yes, we do it 30 days, not even water. <laughs> no, no dry fasting. And I mean, can I just have a sister moment with you, Madiha? I, so we start fasting at puberty and I remember yes. fasting in middle school and high school. I miss the days that I would play on the volleyball team or do step aerobics while fasting. Like right now, when you say it, I'm like, oh, you love for a cup of coffee right now, you know? <laughs> But here's a fun fact is that I don't think a lot of our colleagues know I, um, you know, I appreciate the thought leaders that have made intermittent fasting trendy in the East. Most of them are um, middle to elderly aged Caucasian men. Um, and if you dig deep in some of the well-researched books, you, you see the research that Dr. Madiha and I are, are this, but did you know that it is our Muslim doctors and scientists for decades that have been researching the benefits and the challenges of dry fasting. I want to honor the other global religions and traditions such as our brothers and sisters in Judaism or Hinduism or Catholicism who have fasting as well as a part of their religions. These are the um, uh, kind of a lot of the foundation of the science you see today of intermittent fasting. So um, I, I really wanted to highlight that. And I think we'll hear more about it at the AIHM meeting, as, as I recall. But, you know, it is, it's, um, we wake up for something known as suhoor, which is finishes an hour before sunrise. And that is your time to have a morning breakfast. Um, I have such happy childhood memories of that. My father, um, being a physician, was busy in a small town. 
And we always felt like as kids, that was our quiet time with our dad. And we would all help our mom in the kitchen, making our favorite foods to eat for the day ahead and hydrate. Now, thank goodness for what we know with integrative medicine. I've got all my mineral concoctions and everything to get the right calibration of protein and healthy fats to get me through the day. But gosh, we did it when we were younger. And Dr. Mathia, do you want to tell people about Iftar? Oh, yes. Um, so we... Yes. Open our fasts when the sun comes down, and believe me, we are all sitting there waiting for that <laughs> exact minute. Seven fifty nine p.m. Yes, East Coast exactly. time in Florida today. <laughs> we are waiting for that last minute. As soon as it opens, we got dates in our plate in hand. Yes. But you know, fasting is like an integral part of Islam, and now the science that shows, you know, that sheds a light on the importance of fasting and healing and, you know, slowing down and it even helps to like slow down aging It decreases cytokines, decreases the macrophages, increases the, optimizes the microbiome, increases the resistance to stress and lowers oxidative stress, increases autophagy. So um, we try, uh, there is, so iftar, this is one thing that the Muslims have gotten it right, but still working on is focus. You know, we, we, some of us tend to gain weight. <laughs> yeah, I will Yes, add. there are tons of health benefits, but unfortunately, because we eat badly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Because it's like going to a holiday party, it's especially a holiday a party every day in here. Yeah. Like big meals, but you know, I don't want to highlight just the food and, and uh, Dr. Mark Hawk, a uh, Hawk is here too, is Ramadan is also this time to really be mindful and it's like a cleansing and fasting of your thoughts and yes. your actions and your words and really being mindful. And I'm not just avoiding eating and drinking, but mm -hmm. avoiding gossiping and toxic yes. conversations. And I, I, I will say this, as, as someone that is uh, learned mindfulness, uh, you know, you know, a negative experience I had that I shared with Dr. Tabby was, um, uh, I taught mindfulness and I remember one of my first AIHM meetings and they were like, Oh, you're a mindfulness expert. I'm like, yeah, I've worked with so-and-so teachers around the world, but so much of it was influenced by my Sufi teachers as well as Buddhist and Hindu teachers. And one of the thought leaders at that time in the community who was speaking, who actually had Rumi quotes in his slide saw me hugging you, Madiha, and saying salam to you. And he was like, wait, you speak on mindfulness and you're Muslim? And I think like, wow, what, a, what an opportunity to learn, you know, is there is nothing more than in Ramadan, this present centered awareness just happens. I, I can sense the new moon is coming that day or that night there, there's like this energetic slowdown of planet earth. And I feel present as they say in Sufism, that we're all one being with the other humans, the animals, even the blade of grass and the birds and the trees. And that's what I feel in Ramadan. It's, it's this present centered awareness of everything that it, that is God's creatures and beings. Mm, and absolutely. we really honor that. And, and we should all year, but something about Ramadan makes me slow down in that sacred presence awareness. Absolutely. And even in the Quran, that, that's actually the purpose of fasting yeah. is that God has told us that, oh, that you have believed fasting has been prescribed to you, just like it was prescribed to those that are before you. So then you may attain God consciousness and mindfulness. And, um, and this is the time where, you know, Ramadan is more than just not eating. It, per it should be percolating through every aspect of our daily lives as um, you know, our, what our hands are doing, what we're, you know, our entire body should be fasting, self-control, the feelings of compassion of the less fortunate, building community, family, you know, learning patience, connecting with not just our soul, but connecting with, you know, the planet yes. and taking care of it all. Amen. And so this Amen. is where it, you know, this is a time where we slow down um, because I think otherwise right now, you know, we're, our lives are just consumed with eating. <laughs> yes, <know>? it is. <laughs> well, I think we joke because Medea and I know as friends, we, we both love food and sharing food. Love food. It's a part of our cultures. I, I think food should be the sixth love language, like universally. <laughs> I'll tell you this as a chief wellness officer of over 7,000 employees, we have a global diverse workforce. Food has been a uniting concept of, of all of us. And you'll hear me talk about it this year at the AIHM Academy about disrupting planetary health and and how we we scale in a diverse company but um you know i i circle back to 
move the conversation forward and bring it back. So just a few things. It's if someone is Muslim, don't be scared to ask us. Like what I love is when someone says, how is your Ramadan going? Um, remember that if it's a, a person that was gender assigned female at birth, we don't fast while we're on our menstrual cycle. Our children are not required to fast prior to puberty. So, some, so, so if you see a woman at work going, wait, you're not fasting. I see you drinking coffee. And Dr. Romy said you couldn't even have coffee during fasting. You know, be mindful. She may be pregnant. She may be on her menstrual cycle. I may not want to enjoy, announce that in the workplace. So just something to say is how is your Ramadan going? And we'll yeah. let you know. And you can say, and, and so many of you have said it um, in the chat. And I love that Ramadan Kareem or Ramadan Mubarak. Yes. So th those are some things and, and that, and, um, you know, one, one day we'll have a meeting during Ramadan and maybe we'll have an iftar party for AHM and the Academy, inshallah, you know, and inshallah, when you hear us saying it is saying with God's will. Um, I think the last thing, and then I know Dr. Madiha wanted to transition to the Quranic prescription for a healing. We covered some really general topics to introduce Islam and your colleagues that identify as Muslim. I saw a question come through here about uh, address a husband speaking for a wife in the office. I think um, a lot of times one of the stereotypes Muslim communities can get is that uh, women don't have a voice if they're married or um, don't speak or the men control. And what I want to say is, yes, that can happen in many Muslim countries. It can happen in those religions that don't have identify as Muslims as well. When we look at the actual teachings of the Quran, it was one of the first religions that offered empowerment to women. It was um, Aisha, the Prophet Muhammad's wife, peace be upon her, that and him that converted to Islam first. And she was actually one of the most powerful business people in the world at that time <laughs> and the company she ran. And, um, you know, so many inspiring stories of strong Muslim women, including the two sisters you have here and the many that are in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. And so there is nothing about a woman not speaking out for her emotional, physical, spiritual well-being, a right to education. I'm not going to lie. We have a lot of work to do we in do. the Muslim community here in the United States and around the world. So I don't want to minimize it. Uh, Dr. Madiha and I in our private lives are staunch advocates in as a part of a lot of the charity work we do. But I, I hope by just seeing how well-spoken and fun Dr. Madiha and I are, this is the, what it is to be Muslim in America. Uh, you know, God bless the opportunity for that. So, um, you know, I think anytime a woman isn't able to speak for herself in the office, no matter what religion they're identifying as, I think as a doctor, I always want to dig a little deeper. And especially if you have a female identifying nurse or female doctor in the office to see if they can have a private conversation with that woman as, you know, that's how I was trained in medicine is to always be mindful when a child or someone can't speak for themselves in the office. Um, I wanted to address that question. I think I'm going to transition with this and then hand it over to Dr. Medea, who's going to talk to you about her newest best-selling book about chronic prescription. I learned about healing in Sufism first when I was in my own journey of burnout um, and healing and found the path to mindfulness long before there was like apps on our cell phone or something on our watch saying, girl, pause, breathe. It was really weird then. I was using cassette tapes. And, and when I found myself to some of my Sufi teachers, I really loved this elements of healing um, because what I find and what I hope we are is bridge builders in, in America, it's so polarized compared to anywhere else that I travel in the world. People are like, either you go to yoga and you meditate and you use essential oils and all traditional medicine is bad, or you're in the traditional medicine world and everything we're talking about is woo woo and we're bridge builders. And I really wanted to give this example of how I approach healing from a Sufi perspective is that there are five elements that make us balanced. It's, it's our rational thinking, so as a neurotic neurologist, I love that. But if you just focus on that, we can go out of balance. Think of anxiety. There's our you know, physical sensations, which are often addressed in traditional medicine. There's our emotions and our feelings and that we must address that and how we are in all ranges. There's the ability to have imagination. And the last one is intuition. And to have true whole health, it's a balance of all five in, in ours and that there is wisdom, you know, from everything of the thoughts you have 
to the foods you eat, to, to how we take care of our planet that really are that. And so I always now, I'm no longer seeing patients one-to-one though I'm still uh, licensed and board certified with the company I run. But when I'm coaching executives or talking to teams, that's, and even when I think as a chief wellness officer, how am I thinking of wellness for a large company when we're consulting or that it's individuals balance of rationality, their physical being, their mental health, emotions, your sense of imagination and your intuition. So all five of those come together is how I have learned to approach my healing, healing of other individuals. And my job now is to heal teams and organizations. So I just really wanted to close from my perspective on that is Sufism and Islamic healing as I know it. Now I want to hand it over to Dr. Madia who has done incredible research with the Quran and is really leading a charge in the Muslim community of wait a minute, like maybe the way we were eating and defining halal is, is a little different. And, and Maria, I'm going to hand it over to you, sister. Oh, thank you so much. Beautiful thoughts. Uh, and then I think I'll just piggyback off of that because it's all about balance. And this is where I think I love holistic medicine. It's not because, you know, it's just something that I just came across is because for me, holistic medicine and being holistic is ingrained in every cell of my body. And because Islam is a holistic religion and our traditions, if you look uh, you know, at our book, God has told us how to eat, how to live, how to love, how to, you know, greet people, how to sleep. So it is a very, you know, a holistic religion and just like, you know, just like we're trying to keep these social norms balanced, and we know that the social norms will continue to change, but we as Muslims believe that if we adhere to this baseline that God has given us, we maintain that balance. And when we maintain that balance, you know, and though that balance is actually very similar, it's all the same as what Dr. Romi just talked about, all those key pieces. And um, when we maintain that balance, everything inside starts working better. Everything on the outside starts to work better. Our brain, our body, body, our social, physical, mental, emotional, all start to function the way that they should. But unfortunately, that's what's going on in the world today. It's that the balance is becoming lost. You know, uh, we're more stressed than ever before. We're eating more junk food than ever before. You know, um, the negative social environment and. I know when I was, I know me and Dr. Romi have very similar experiences that brought us to this world of holistic medicine. And for me, it was, I was also diagnosed with an, like an autoimmune disease. Um, and I knew, and I was miserable. And I knew that, you know, when I went towards one doctor to another doctor to try to get some relief from these symptoms, I was told, sorry, there's not really nothing you can do about it. And God has always given us hope from the Quran. And um, we actually, the first word that God sent down to Muslim, like to, to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was Iqra, read. So the actual, the importance of gaining knowledge and education is made obligatory on every Muslim. So this is where for us, and, then, and that when you combine that with the hope, we're like, no, there must be something more that we can do. We're going to keep on looking at the positive and keep on looking for answers. And therefore, you know, I was guided to integrative, holistic, functional medicine. And then when I started studying that, I'm like, oh my gosh, all of these key pieces of, you know, for example, gratitude, you know, eating well, sleeping well, stress management, mindfulness, meditation, uh, nature, uh, lowering the toxins in our environment, all of these were in tune and in line with me as a Muslim. And so for me, this was just a natural, like, you know, growth that now I'm actually starting to live the religion, live actually what I was taught. Because <laughs> I think that that's really not what we're doing nowadays, because we're stuck on this hamster wheel, you know, in that stress, you know, cycle and we're not being mindful, we're rushing through our prayers, we're like not really connecting with nature, um, not fasting the way that we're fasting, but eating junk. Like, so we're not getting, we're getting off of that natural balance and that, that creates, we see in the conventional medical world um, that we're, we're getting sick because of that. 
And, um, and so just bringing these key foundational pieces back in the digestive health, the detoxification, the four S's stress, sleep, social and spiritual health um, is really important because all of that has been dictated by the Muslim, by the Quran and the Sunnah and how we should be living our lives. And if we truly lived our lives that way, um, we would be, you know, really living optimally. And so when you see your Muslim patient, this is something specifically as a, us as holistic healthcare providers, we can connect with them on that level that, you know, meditation and prayer are part of our religion, being mindful. We as Muslims are supposed to be mindful. The second verse in the Quran is, um, after Surah Fatiha is that this is the Alif La Mim, this is the book for those that are mindful. So literally living mindfully is the way that we should be living. Um, so that's another thing that you can connect with your Muslim patient on. The other thing, I know that we have a large challenge with Muslims that are obese. <laughs> Everybody that's obese, but let's another elephant in the room, you know, India and Pakistan are the diabetes capital of the world, you know, um, out of the most obese countries, a lot of them are, some of them are Muslim countries. Yeah. yeah. So, right. And so therefore talking to Muslims about health, um, there is actually, again, this is what I dive into in the, in the, my next book is that we as Muslims have been actually been taught the way that we should be eating is, oh, believers, eat a wish that is pure, a what God has provided you, and be grateful to God if it is indeed God that you worship. Now, that's really heavy. And that comes not just once, but multiple, like over 15 times in the, in the Quran, and the importance of eating pure, real foods, and how that's directly linked to our faith, and the decisions that we made. And now we know that the, uh, that the and as a Muslim, we're supposed to eat one third food, one third air, one third water. So like, we're not supposed to be eating. So these are simple things that you can use, you know, to connect with your Muslim patients, um, to because as a Muslim, we're supposed to be eating pure foods, real foods, not the junk food. So, like, meaning non processed foods, Dr. Medina. Like, foods. I really want to translate that into simple terms, like the organic whole foods, you yeah, know, non GMO, absolutely, and, and non processed package. And, you know, there, there shouldn't, you know, I, I live in a world where. I, yeah, as a chief wellness officer in Sufism, I want the paleos and the vegans to sit down together, you know, yeah. and whether you're gluten-free or dairy-free or not should yeah. not divide us. You know, we should have a table. I, I wanted to interject there because we have a few questions, but we had a good one and you just mentioned it. Yeah. Somebody asked about the diabetic patients when they're fasting. I'm going to start off on it. And Dr. Madhya, I'm going to have you finish. I just want to say overall in Islam, um, it is a very... Uh, understanding religion of a way of life. And there is something that when you have illness, you actually are not supposed to be fasting. It is written clearly in the Quran. And if you require medications, for example, during the day. So, you know, diabetes is such a broad spectrum disease from type one to type two to type three diabetes and how blood sugar is managed, whether it's oral hypoglycemics diet alone or insulin. Um, you know, uh, normally the Islamic scholars and doctors will say, if you require metformin and insulin, you should really not be fasting and the hypoglycemia that can happen. However, remember it's an individual choice and people, you know, I have diabetics in my extended family that are, I am going to fast regardless. And so, you know, know that Islam doesn't require them to fast, but some people are going to be like, I'm going to manipulate my medicines and foods. And so Dr. Mithi, I wanted to ask like, what are some suggestions you have? Cause I mean, we could spend an hour and we only have three minutes left and we have several other questions I wanted to quickly get through, but do, can, do you have one or two quick tips you say to people that are on um, oral hypoglycemics? I, I don't know of any Muslim doctor that would allow a Muslim who is on requiring insulin to fast. I mean, I, I just don't think that's, you know, responsible medicine. We would have a talk with them with a, a imam or scholar, but what would you say to someone that's pre-diabetic or on just an oral hypoglycemic agent? Oral hypoglycemic agent, I mean, the people that I see, obviously, um, we're managing a lot of that with diet and lifestyle. Yeah. Like, for example, my grand, my father-in-law came to me, he started living with me after he had a, had a heart attack, and he was on 30 units of insulin. So during that time, obviously not in Ramadan, but in before that, now he's just taking oral, oral hypoglycemic, so he just has to take twice a day. 
and he uh, with metformin and he's able to manage it. And so he's able to fast actually doing really well. Um, so again, that's an individual decision. Go to your doctor. But that's not normal, Dr. Madea. You not normal. cook, you you cook like the your... pure foods because in, in, <laughs> so that's real, another, yes. in real life, and you know, I want to have some Dr. Romy real here. talk. Most people yes. don't have a Dr. Madea cooking for them, low glycemic, <laughs> so that's whole a, foods that's a three so that's times a day. Like this is the real world, no matter whether you're in the United Kingdom, India, or the United States, like it's not easy for diabetics who are working full time and don't have someone like you cooking Absolutely. for them. So, so that's why really, talk to your doctor, figure yeah. out what's, what works best for you. Everybody a continuous different. blood sugar monitor, you know, yeah. all of that, because we know over time intermittent fasting can help oh. that, but you know, but Ramadan should really not be treated like all over the place. No. Yeah. Not doing well. Not dangerous. Yeah. We had a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, Dr. Tabby, do you want to order them for us and we can just quickly do it? We don't want to run over. Yeah. Yeah. So, last sure. Of um, it, it, you, there are two more questions. Um, would you like me to read them? Sure. Um, please. Yeah. Okay. So, the first one is from Leila Weiser. Um, she says, Wasalam. One of the benefits of Islam, as I experience it, is the balance between work and rest, quiet time and community time, moderation in many ways, and the prayers and holidays connected to the natural cycles of the sun and moon. I personally think the loss of that balance is part of the increase in mental distress and illness nowadays. I'd love to know your perspective. Yeah. Salam and Ramadan Kareem to you, sister. And yeah, I think that goes back to what both Dr. Madhi and I were saying that like in the Sufi tenets, it's a balance of rationality, your thinking, your physical, your emotion, well-being, imagination time and intuition time and that balance. And, you know, we have to balance. We live in the real world and technology time has increased and kids are given laptops and iPads and school and all of that. But really, it doesn't mean you have to shun all those things. It is finding that balance regardless of what religion you you follow. And so I, I think that's so well said. I would agree. Dr. Madiha, anything Absolutely. to add? I think you and I are saying the same thing. Yeah. yeah. The lack of the balance is leading to a lot of chronic yeah. illness. That yeah. in the world today. Yeah. Great. And the second question comes from Rashid Ali. She says, can you address why some Sufi Iman scholars say it is okay to fast, pray, enter the mosque while women are menstruating? We were raised Sunni Muslim, but have a few Sunni friends who have told me their sheikh said it's okay. I don't know what to say to them. I, if you have any comments on that or ideas. I say that. You know, the one thing I will always say is mindfulness has taught me to have compassion and non-judgment. Yet I, I'm also going to say this is my dad was born in India, my mother in Pakistan. We can be a judgmental people and just have this feeling to say, you know, you should wear this or you shouldn't do this or that. And I, I think anytime when we're going to reach out and say something to someone, what is my intention behind it? Because even as a doctor, I can say probably 90% of the time ego is driving it rather than that. And, you know, I wait until somebody asks me something before I tell them. It's also one of the wisest lessons I've learned as a leader and chief wellness officer, right? So one, I, I'm just going to say that's what I've learned as a leader and mindfulness, specifically as someone that practiced Sufism. I don't want to say that that is normal for all Sufi schools. There are so many Sufi schools. It's become complicated here in the West because many people, um, have identified that they say we quote teach Sufism without the Islam in it and that's not something I personally identify with I think those are people that are taking our beautiful teachings and culturally appropriating them to create beautiful communities the way I see it and, and please you can argue with me is that you know Sufis love and respect people of all religions we are all one community and one tribe and a lament for us to all get to know one another as it's stated in many verses in the Quran however true Sufism is based in Islam and, and I can tell you from the multiple um, Islamic schools of Sufism it is the similar thing is that a time for a woman's menstruation isn't that she's dirty it's actually a time for cleansing and resting and so the extra duties of going to the mosque or fasting should not be done and take that time to, you know, as, as somebody else already said, cycle with your lunar and solar calendar and, you know, have that time for rest and cleansing and thoughtfulness and to recharge. And so in the true Islamic centers, 
uh, when we are menstruating, we do not enter. Uh, you know, th there are different Islamic centers in the United States where it's a center that may also have a school and a community hall. It's okay for a woman to enter, but yeah. we should not be in the prayer hall praying. You don't pray. Yeah. yeah. And that, that is it is what I want to say from a Sufi point of view. And my next dua would be that I would hope that we are not divided as Muslims between Shia, Sunni, Bora, uh, Sufi, and all the other sects that in today's world that we come together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I just want to make a couple of comments. I mean, first of all, I love how you've just both really shifted so many negatives into the positive. I mean, even just your comments around, you know, menstruating and these questions, it's like, it's really about self-care and that space to take sure. care of oneself. And, you know, the fasting instead of removal, it's really about filling up and gratitude. And it's just been such a beautiful presentation. Um, and I wanted to just um, end with one question that I have. And, you know, last week, um, the Indian government had a wonderful, incredible ceremony um, because they have established through the WHO, um, a global center for traditional medicine and have put $250 million into Ayush and moving forward um, Ayush globally. And, you know, being the second or third, depending on where you get your information, the second or third uh, largest Muslim country in the world, I just want to highlight that leadership as well. And what we will hopefully see out of that in the integrative space and um, in bringing um, the Muslim perspective into all that we are doing globally. So um, I just didn't, I would love to hear your thoughts or comments on that before we close. Now, Dr. Parker, what I'll say is that the Islamic traditions in healing and in STEM date back centuries, everything from algebra um, to uh, studying the astronomy. Um, so many concepts in medicine uh, come from the Holy Quran that now have been passed through different cultures and the benefits of certain foods that are now, uh, you know, part of the holistic medicine realm. And that I, I, I look at this one teaching, and then I'm going to give it to Dr. Madiha, is um, in every major religion of the world and um, in every holy book is this concept of, in English translates into, I am, I am one, uh, the I am that I am. Mm -hmm. In the holy Quran, it is this concept that Allah is closer to you than your own carotid artery. Yeah, and, and that we're all this like one consciousness and that that universal truth is in every religion. I hope that this is a sign that we'll no longer be divided as healers, but realize we all have so much to give from yeah. one another and, and to each other, and that our global healing traditions are really anchored in one consciousness. That would be my wisdom to share in that. Yes, mine. Beautiful. I echo that. I echo that. If we can really just put, a, put, a, put aside our differences and focus on all the positive that each one of us bring to the world, we can actually reunite and create so much more good in the world. So coming together, putting aside our differences is the best way to, you know, create peace and change. Well, I want to thank both of you again. This has been one of the best wellness webinars we've ever had. And just really two incredible, visionary, empowered Muslim women leaders in medicine, I just thank you for all that you are doing for our communities, um, for young girls around the world, for all of us, um, just huge, huge thanks for being a part of this community and for coming today. I learned so much today. It was just so wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Tabby. I, I just thank you for being that sister that's modeling this open consciousness of um, bringing. I, I just see how much change you and the rest of the leadership are bringing to AIHM. And thank you for inviting a global perspective. And, and again, I'm going to say this, I look forward to speaking and sharing a little bit more of my journey at AIHM. And if you're watching, we hope to see you at the meeting in October. Inshallah. That's right. That's right. So um, I think we'll be closing out now just before we do go. Um, and thank you, Romy, for um, speaking about the upcoming conference. Um, so this year we will be in person again. Finally, we're very excited. 
Um, and one of our speakers is Romy Mushtaq. So if you liked hearing her today, please come join us in San Diego. Uh, we'll be there October 28th to the 30th. Um, and the conference is Disruptive Innovation and the Future of Health. So we would love you all to uh, join us there in person once again. We've been waiting for this for a couple of years now, and we're very excited to get, to get back together. Lastly, um, I really encourage all of you, if you're not a member, please consider joining the Academy. Um, you can join as an individual or as an organization. We are truly building a global movement together so that we can transform healthcare on this planet. And we need you all to be a part of that. So imagine the change we could make as a unified community, moving forward positivity and inclusion um, and, and health on this planet. So connect with us. Uh, you can find us at AIH AIHM Global on all the different social media channels, and we hope to see you soon. So have a wonderful weekend and um, happy Ramadan, the final part of it. And I wish I could say that in um, the proper language, but this, it was just phenomenal. So thanks again for being here. <laughs>